Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 114 of DM Discussions, the podcast for players and DMs alike, where we cover a wide variety of topics to help you with your games. I'm your host, Ryan Reeder, and with me, as always, is my good buddy, Ben Bumhoffer. How you doing tonight, Ben? I am insanely overwhelmed, but uh, more on that. Oh, boy. Bit here. But uh, aside from that, doing doing OK. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, the overwhelm that Ben is talking about is uh, in the last week, we have been hit with a deluge of information uh, about the new 2024 D&D books. Uh, just everything um mainly though the player's handbook that's that's been the big focus and then like deep dives into classes they are still ongoing (laughs) as of the recording of this uh so just just as a heads up most of the episodes that we do um in many ways are kind of evergreen content a lot of the stuff we we don't try to get super nitty gritty into mechanical details. A lot of times, uh, a lot of stuff, uh, DM advice. This is stuff you can kind of listen to, you know, years after it's recorded and it will still have, you know, uh, relevance. Yeah. There are episodes like this. Um, we don't do a whole lot that are a little more in the moment as far as news and stuff goes, because this is a, a fairly big deal as it's, Essentially, even though they're not calling it, it's essentially a new edition of D&D, right? Yeah. Or at least like a 0. 0.5 or whatever. You know, it's it's new enough that they're making a very big deal about it and reissuing the player's handbook, the monster manual and the dungeon master's guide. So that means new edition, no matter what they want to call it. Yeah, so it's 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 a very it's a very big thing. It's a very core thing. D&D, obviously, still uh, the biggest tabletop RPG um, just by the numbers. Um, and it's something we love, uh, to play as well. So, uh, this episode and probably some next episode will be dedicated to talking about some of the new stuff, uh, for the 2024, uh, release of the revised player's handbook, monster manual and dungeon master's guide. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of these things, uh, we want to talk about our stuff that is new stuff works cited about, uh, and hopefully it will help you decide if you want to move your game, uh, be it a current game or a game that you are planning, uh, on playing upcoming to this, uh, this new revised system. Uh, so far I am, I am currently DMing a campaign. Uh, there is a high likelihood I will be moving, at least a a good chunk of my content over to this new system as well. So, um, Ben, let's, let's get into it. They, they we'll, we'll have a lot of videos in the show notes on the indiscussions.com, mm-hmm. but they are long. Like we're, we're talking an over an hour for the one on the player's handbook. Uh, each of the character ones is, roughly 20 to 30 minutes long. Uh, so we're going to try and help you condense that into like an hour ish or so of, yeah. of content. So on the Dungeons and Dragons YouTube page is where you have that hour long video that, I mean, it, it, it touches on a lot of different things. Um, I freaked out when I saw the D and D beyond YouTube page had a bunch more videos, but it's just chunks of that long uh, video kind of broken out into different sections. So uh, I had a sigh of relief because I'm like, oh, there's so much more I need to <laughs> consume, but I don't. Um, but before we get into it, I just want to say I'm I'm kind of with you. I am most likely changing the 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 systems to the the new update and everything. Um, I've already talked to my players and said that you know, kind of giving the heads up. Hey, there's the new uh, players handbook coming out. What we'll do because it is going to be backwards compatible with the 2014 D and D we're going to look at your class at least and like 90%. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, they said specifically that, um, you can play a 2014 character right next to a 2024 character. You know, they're kind of different flavors and stuff. Um, and that's in totally how it's intended. I'm sure that not a hundred percent everything works, but there are certain mechanics like overall that, you definitely want to update if you're running with the 2024, you know, rule set. But I told my players, we're going to take a look at the, you know, the old class versus the new class. 
we, I want everybody to have fun and continue having fun. Whatever seems to work best for you right now, that's what we're going to go with. When we start our next campaign, that's something entirely different. But you know this. There's new stuff. We'll see what happens. It's kind of like yeah, when uh, I, Tasha's came out. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think I'm kind of on board. I think for this campaign, it'll be more of a... We'll probably switch to the rules system uh, for 2024, mm -hmm. but... I'll let you, them compare their characters. And if they want to keep the current version of the character, they'll be more than welcome yeah, to. Exactly. Right? I think, I think many of them, if not all will probably want to switch to the new ones because the new ones do sound like lots of fun. There's been a lot of, uh, much needed tweaks and revisions. There's been new stuff. Uh, like we'll talk about shortly, like weapon mastery. Uh, like, that is a really big deal for martial classes. That alone is kind of the only reason you want to switch. And there's a hundred other reasons. So yeah, let's... yeah, it's, it's, that one's pretty big. So I, I think, um, yeah, it'll be one of those things. One of the things they haven't talked about yet that I was thinking about as I was consuming all this stuff is I wonder if they're going to have a, clean way in D and D beyond to convert your character, or if you're going to have to rebuild your character from scratch. I believe if I could be wrong, because again, it's a lot of content to kind of go over. Um, I believe that there is, well, no, because they didn't say specifically about D and D beyond, but they did say, if you were switching, you need to switch all the way. You can't pick and choose from 2014 and 2024 to Correct. make a character. So I would assume that they're going to have like a convert on D and D beyond. I, again, that's just a total assumption there. Um, but if you do decide to do that, make sure you copy the character first before you convert that over. Because I mean, the way that it is right now, you can have, uh, you know, certain supplements or, um, settings and stuff actually available and uh, usable in D and D beyond. So if they have something similar to that and with how they add up and change numbers and everything already anyway, I mean, it may be a big ask, but I would think as soon as you activate that, it just con would convert what they need to over and then probably pop up with like, Hey, you need to choose this or do this or do that. So we'll see. I, I, I kind of have a theory as well, and I don't have any necessarily, um, backing for this but i don't know about you it feels like D, D beyond hasn't really other than maps they haven't really done much in the way of core features or ui or anything for quite quite some time yeah um so i i have a theory that when the new player's handbook drops D, &D beyond will be getting like a big overhaul that will launch at the same time I could see that. I mean, because they're 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 gonna have to they're gonna have to have a way for 2014 and 2024 content to live, to coexist in the same space. Mm -hmm. But like as it is right now, there'll be like potentially three or four versions of the same monster that say like <laughs> legacy or something. Next, there's gonna have to be a better way. There's gonna have to be a better filtering system than they have right now, which is not a super amazing. Yeah. So I. I I will be disappointed if there's not, but I, I feel like, especially with the lack of at least the seeming lack of stuff that I've seen over the past like year, year and a half, it feels like that new player's handbook dropping would be the time to do that. Also launch a big full on kind of revision of D and D beyond. And I would think that, I mean, they want everybody to get the 2024 versions. I would think that they're going to force any new character creation into that. I would assume. Oh so. yeah. Yeah. Well, because, I, I, I mean, assume they've well, already talked about putting the new SRD in the creative commons. Oh yeah, exactly. And so that will like, they will likely, yeah, that will be the default for yeah. like free accounts and such. Because I mean, back when, and this was before wizards of the coast actually owned them though. Like when, uh, unearth arcana would be in there that you could, you know, use it, add it, make characters and everything like that. But as soon as they took it out, 
it was gone, but you were still able to do, you know, if you had a character created with that, you still had all the different levels and everything, you know, for like a subclass or, or whatever. So we know that they have that ability there to still have those things active, but hidden from like new creation. So it could be, and I mean, I'm definitely not a coding person at all, but we know at least it has the ability to do something similar. So completely changing everything to all the new stuff, especially with the character creator, I can see working. Um, and then anything that's been made previously. Yeah. Just, it, it's still there for you to use. Yeah. They, they have said that none of your bot stuff is disappearing. Um, you will continue to retain access to all the, anything you've bought, any of the old stuff. Uh, I don't, I don't know whether or not they'll stop selling, uh, the old stuff or not either. They haven't said, I would guess no, at least for a while. Um, but that is that is something that could potentially happen at some point too. Well, I mean, I would think that the player's handbook, the monster manual, and then the DMG will probably not be sold anymore. Like they would probably just straight up replace that. I mean, when they released uh, the new, you know, kind of updated monster manual or the the monsters of the multiverse, a lot of that legacy content is not purchasable anymore if i remember correctly because they want you to use the new versions of it with the new stat box and everything mm -hmm. so again we kind of have a precedent of something similar happening so yeah. i mean we'll, we'll see how it goes yeah well let's uh let's dive in yeah let's uh, talk about the so things this, we do know <laughs> yeah yeah so this is this is from um the the overview of the player's handbook but they also sprinkled in a little bit on the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual, which I assume will get more full uh, videos to talk about them, you know, either in the next week or two or a little more down the road because there's a few months in between each each release, right? Exactly. Um, so some big stuff that really stood out for me uh, as they were talking about the 2024 edition, uh, the word flexible really stood out, like flexibility. Mm -hmm. Flexibility of what your class can do, flexibility of what your subclass can do, flexibility of backgrounds, feats, uh, and everything. The 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 big thing uh, for backgrounds actually is that they are getting almost more uh, encompassed. So your stats, your stat upgrades are not going to come from your species anymore. They're going to come from your background. Um, and those background stat increases are fairly varied as in like this background lets you do charisma, intelligence, and wisdom mm -hmm. or whatever charisma, intelligence, constitution, and you can do one in each or two in one and one in, in another. But they, they said they tried to make the widest possible things that made sense for those backgrounds so that they weren't super limiting to your class exactly anymore and, and they I mean, all come with free feats mm -hmm. as well yeah which and is super cool one of the best parts about that is that um you know it, it gives you more of an identity when you're creating a character if you have an, a, a background of like say uh you know a circus performer or something like that it makes sense that you would have performance as something that you want to do but as a performer you probably want to have more of a charisma type background as well so you know th they might have the option for charisma and dexterity because maybe you know you're in the circus or strength because you know strongman or you know acrobat or something like that you know they're, they're tying those different things to what makes sense for whatever that background is um something that they joked about too is that uh anything that has constitution which is a whole lot of those backgrounds is a good thing because as we know health comes from constitution having more of it is always a plus uh, but something that i also thought was actually you know completely great too is that um with that they actually have a chart in the player handbook that tells you what backgrounds have what stats. So if you're really trying to go in and min max, you don't have to scour through the entire like list. Okay. This one has this, this one has that. There's going to be a chart handy where you can say, Hey, I want intelligence. Boom. These four backgrounds have intelligence as an option, or, you know, I want constitution. These 87 backgrounds have constitution as an option, you know, whatever. Yeah. So that they, it, they've it really dial it in. They've really pumped up the, there is now glossaries and appendixes. Mm -hmm for everything, which is a huge deal because uh, a lot of that stuff didn't really exist. 
in the original. So uh, they've been touting the everything will be easier to find, which mm-hmm. is which is a big plus, especially if you're using the physical book versus, you know, typing in the search bar. Right. Um, so, yeah, that there's there's a lot of uh, really cool stuff with backgrounds. Um, there's new things called origin feats where uh, certain feats, they, uh, certain feats will be in like a pool of you can get these feats uh, at these levels and then more feats will open up at higher levels as you can still replace, you know, your your attribute score increase with a with a feat if you want to, um, which is super cool. They have the, the videos are really cool and I'm sure someone's made a compilation of it somewhere. The there's just so much art. Oh, like, yes. So much incredible art, not just of the classes and subclasses, which are each getting their own like keystone piece of art, but they're just art everywhere. All the background pieces have a a piece of art with them to kind of help invoke what they are about. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got all the, the species art that may offer a, a, you know, snippet of here's what one sect or version of this species looks like yeah, somewhere they, in the world. And they right? show the whole smattering of different kinds and stuff. Like, especially with the orcs, there's, you know, varied skin colors. They It shows them kind of doing different jobs and things and stuff. And it's, all it is just a, a nice bit of artwork that has just, hey, here's a bunch of orcs. This is what they kind of look like, but, you know, make up your own. Which is really nice. Um, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like adding on to the art, uh, they. I mean, we got to see, I mean, they, they kind of repeated some of them over and over again as they're kind of talking about these because, you know, they don't want to spoil all of them. But like everything we saw was great. Um, the the class art that they showed was just phenomenal. And we've kind of talked about it before from different things that they've been, uh, you know, talking about with what they want to accomplish with the player's handbook. And each subclass has its own, you know, picture. It's its own thing to kind of give you that that fantasy of what it means and they went through and put so much thought and everything into each of these subclasses that they wanted to make people who you know might never play a warlock like me or might never play like a fighter or something um really kind of look at and say okay that looks really cool maybe i should look at this for a change as opposed to just completely bypassing the warlock section like i usually do you know there's going to be some sort of version in there that is probably appealing to me with some sort of playstyle that'll actually work and sometimes those bits of art are what you need to really capture and grab someone's imagination to really open up those possibilities yep yep completely agree and they said for this book, they they touched everything. Every mm-hmm. single class has been touched. Every single subclass has been touched in some way, right? Um, they've added uh, one of the things they they did talk about were is they added some of the most popular homebrew options that have popped up over the last ten years uh, that make sense officially into uh, into the rules, like. Uh, one of the big ones they talked about, which I'm sure many people will be happy about, uh, and I'm sure many people are already using in their games, is potions, healing potions are now officially bonus action. Oh, Drink. Yeah. So that we don't know about the rest of the potions. I would assume likely the rest of the potions as well. Um, but they said specifically healing potions. That's been a homebrew rule since probably the beginning. I've used it for basically every campaign. Yeah. Uh, that I've done. So that's super cool. Um, there is actually like basic crafting options in the player's handbook now for like potions and spell scrolls, which is super cool. And then there's even more advanced crafting uh, rules and such in the dungeon master's guide. Yes. So that is something very cool. That is uh, I think was well needed to be fleshed out uh, because there's a lot of economy type stuff. And we don't need necessarily item by item prices or anything like yeah. that, but more guidance is always good to have. Exactly. And especially when crafting, cause play uh, players want to craft stuff all the time. 
Like that's a very normal thing. So getting some sort of guidance in for that, I think was uh was a good idea. Yeah. And it's also really fun to randomly craft made up stuff too. Uh, just throwing it out there because again, my group is super clever. Uh, my rogue, she made uh, seasickness potions for someone else who it gets seasick on the ship. And since they're traveling that way, there you go. Cool stuff. Now I'd have a guide to know exactly what it should be instead of on the fly, which would be helpful too. Um, speaking of, of just kind of giving them the basics and really helping them out. One of the big things that I absolutely love is that uh, like Circle of Moon Druids have a good selection of beast options in the player's handbook now. Like you look, there's a section that has beasts for, for them. They have uh, a bunch of different creatures and stuff for like familiars. Uh, and even more so for like the summoning spells, those stat blocks are actually in the player's handbook now. There's not going to be any more of the uh summon fey creature your dm will have a list of things that you can use and different stat blocks that can you can use it's all actually in the player's handbook now uh the only thing is of course when circle of the moon Dreams get like way higher level then you're gonna have to look at the monster manual but for the most part like a lot of that is actually already there in the book which was one of the more frustrating things playing like at the table before DD beyond was a thing of playing a druid you wouldn't know what you can really turn into. You get the monster manual and then you have to flip through the entire thing to kind of figure it out and stuff. This is just like such a quality of life benefit. Like a lot of these different things are, uh, speaking of those, uh, druids as well. They were touched. They were worked on. We know that all, the, all the different subclasses, but even more so as Ryan said, all of them were touched in some way and like buffed. Not exactly more powerful, but buffed in the sense of giving them an identity. Um, like one of the neat things that I kind of pulled from from what they were talking about is like the Archfey Warlock is, you know, your patron is a Fey, an Archfey. So you can do different things. Like when you Misty Step, there's like different effects that can happen because you're, you know, following like a trickster and stuff. Um, it, it was great, but they I, I, touched so many. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, no. I was gonna say it. It sounds like uh, your cat is wondering if there's a new cat stat block. Oh, of course, inside there the is. PHP, which apparently they have a ton of animals now. Oh yeah. Not to mention uh, the appendix of the PHP. You know, that's got your like, like your NPCs, like your normal NPC mm -hmm. people, and stuff. they flesh that out apparently yeah. and redone all the stat blocks, which is huge because I used those all the time. Yeah. And with different levels too. So not just like, well, here's my noble. That's the only noble that I will ever have. Who's a CR of a quarter, you know, like or CR get, one half guard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They have more leveled stuff on that too. I mean, like so many different things were touched. So many different things were just upgraded. And I mean, 10 years of play with this edition has given them a lot of feedback, a lot of things to work with. So much so that some of these uh, subclasses that are in there feel like brand new subclasses because they weren't playing well. They weren't playing fun. So they've been completely revamped and reworked, you know, yeah. just like I, they mentioned the specifically like, yeah, they mentioned specifically Beastmaster Ranger mm -hmm. uh, completely overhauled, like way of the four elements uh, monk completely overhauled. They said basically they're, they're both basically new, new subclasses. Yeah. And, and I love this too. It, it's just so much of it is great. And even more so again, and something that's nice and helpful and handy to new players is that the character creation process is literally, it, it is just step by step helps you every step of the way so much more in, in holding your hand than before. Um, there's also like, you know, quick start notes that you can do like when you're working on stats, it tells you these are, you know, the ones that you want to do. They'll have examples of like the standard array where you might want to put them based on the class that you choose. And it goes through backgrounds. It tells you kind of talking about, you know, just this and that. And even more so, it even has guidelines for creating level three characters because that's where your subclass starts. You can just boom, start right off on there. They give you tips and everything with that. And even more so, Ryan, I know you love this. They give you tips on where and how to start in like things for high level characters too. I think the example that they even brought up was like a level 18 character. It's like, there's tips on how to make one of that, those. That was pretty huge. Um, yeah, they, they said this specifically, they had tips for starting at all sorts of different levels. 
Like they gave level three as an example, because uh, this was another big thing too. All subclasses now start at three, just period. Like every, every subclass starts at three, which will take a little getting used to, right? Because for some of them, like a paladin or a, a, a cleric or a, a warlock, um, it's, it's just one of those things like, so I've got powers, but I don't know my patron or I'm not really decided on a God yet. Or, you know, You're I don't have around. an oath I've sworn. And, and so I, I think there's guidance in each class as to what that means, right. To not have that subclass until level mm-hmm. three. Um, but it, that is something that's very different and will take some getting used to. Um, but I will say, RP wise, that gives the DM loads of opportunity to play around with that. I mean, not only is your paladin in paladin school before they figure out, you know, what oath they want to take, your cleric could be doing something. And then you can have something major happen that makes them turn against the God that they're training under and choose something else or, or something along those lines. So it gives them that opportunity to kind of dabble, look and see and really get a feel for what they want their character to do before they choo- choose that domain. Mm-hmm. And again, also the, the really big thing, as I know, I've, as I've, as I'm looking through uh, one of the, one of the things that has stood out to me is a lot of people saying, is this power creep, right? Mm-hmm. Is this is all, are they adding just a bunch of stuff? It, are things going to get stronger? I think in a way, yes, I think, I think there probably is some level of power creep in this. Um, but I think also part of it is just some of it just makes sense and didn't make sense before. Yeah. Like, things being bonus actions or things being baked into attacks that used to cost full actions and stuff. That's part of what they're doing is making the game more fun and streamlined so that you can do more things in a turn without having to have a turn go by and go, I literally can't do anything or my one thing I did missed and, and I'm screwed. Yeah. Right. So it, it it feels much more the way they're they're designing things and the direction they're going is there will be very few turns, especially compared to a 2014 game where you won't be able to do anything or you won't have anything to do. Um, so that's I, I like that part of it a mm-hmm. lot. Um, I like more things being bonus actions uh, so that you can ha- save your action to do do the cool thing. Uh, I like weapon mastery. Let's talk about that for a second, yeah. right? So this is a fully new system, one of the few, because honestly, if, if really overall they've been, I feel like they've been somewhat conservative. Because uh, again, they were bound or they bound themselves. I mean, I guess I don't know. I don't know who, <laughs> who put the initial like thing out or said, this has to be backwards compatible, right? Mm-hmm. Someone had to make that decision at some point. So I think because of doing that, they either have been or had to be a little more conservative in what they did. There are not, tons of fully new systems. There are not tons of like huge departures from what we are used to, but of, of the few that there are weapon mastery is one of the biggest. And this is basically a system that differentiates weapons so that they each have their own thing. Yeah. Instead of just, Hey, this is one D six. This is one D eight whatever then these two are also 1d6 this one's also 1d8 and yeah, you just kind of pick which one kind of looks cool yeah, yeah exactly but so now pretty much all the martial classes are getting weapon mastery in some way shape or form uh with the fighter being the one that will get it to the the largest extent but from what it sounded like as they were talking through some examples of weapon mastery, like cleave, which allows, which allows you to hit other people, or um, I, I forget the the name off the top of my head, but basically uh, like Nick or something like Grace. that, where Graze, Graze, 
uh, where even if you miss, you still do some damage, right? Mm -hmm. Um, being able to trip, being able to push, um, just all sorts of different combos that you could potentially, uh, use in conjunction with one another or use with some of your class features. Um, they, they seem to very much, uh, give the impression that weapon swapping or using multiple weapons is something that is going to be highly encouraged to find different combos of weapon masteries that work together or with other class or subclass mm -hmm. features, uh, to do other, you know, really cool things. And so they, they talked a lot about that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about fighters, but, uh, it does sound like a big deal. And especially for fighters, and like barbarians, I think this will give people much more to do or much more to think about and be able to be much more tactical. They talked about that a lot to making combat more fluid, more tactical, more interesting. Exactly. This is really adding a little, a level of synergy that we've never had before in a lot of these combats. And if you're a caster, like especially a pure caster and you're sitting here thinking, man, that sounds really cool. I wish I could do something with the new system. Well, the best part is, is like, just like how there's a magic initiate feats, there's going to be some sort of weapon mastery feats that you can choose as well. So, you know, if you're a wizard and you want to, I don't know, usually you, you totally be a Gandalf and use a long sword, uh, they're going to have some sort of weapon mastery feat for you to be able to use that with. Um, or, you know, daggers, crossbows, bows, you know, whatever you're going to be able to, you know, join in on this and be part of the, the whole brand new shiny fun thing, which I think is a great way of doing that so that you're not alienating like, you know, a good chunk of your player base with new systems. So I'm well, looking forward yeah. to that. And they, and the, that's the other cool thing. It's not just, uh, martial, it's the, the range weapons too. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the crossbow, the long bow. The, the hand crossbow, the heavy crossbow, it, all these uh, different ranged weapons, rangers are getting this too. Yeah. Oh, and like the, the, the cool thing is like a heavy crossbow, it's going to have a push, you know, because so much power is going into it. Whereas a longbow, you're actually slowing someone down because you're, you're keeping them at that distance and stuff. So just between those two right there, those are two different effects that, flavorly match whatever the weapon is and totally fits with what you would want to happen, you know, using it. I just, Oh, I love it. I, I can't wait to get in and really deep dive into a lot of these things and see what they've come up with, what's made it through the unearthed arcana and really like, this is kind of one of the first times that I really want to be like, I just want to play a fighter now so that I can yeah. just use every weapon. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, they talked about, because I know I've had this conversation with uh, several of the people I play with, they had initially talked about rolling the battle master into the base class, mm -hmm. which I thought was super interesting, but they decided against it because weapon masteries for one kind of helped fill that gap. And for two, they wanted to keep that as its own, you know, unique identity and not water it down. So yeah. I, I, I think with all the changes and with weapon masteries, that was probably probably the right decision um, to go with. Oh, and um, in case you're wondering, yeah, kind of a hybridish classes like Paladin will also have weapon mastery uh, just because, you know, they're able to cast magic doesn't mean that they don't have those same abilities as well. Um, the one thing that they haven't touched on, which when they get to the class, oh, I'm assuming they will, but like what's going on with an open hand monk? Are their fists and stuff going to start getting different types of weapon masteries since they're I not don't using weapons. Monks get weapon mastery. Well, that is not as good as I would like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, I, yeah, their attacks are magical. Why can't they just, you know, well, I mean, I, guess, I mean, I'm sure they'll get all sorts of dis cool discipline. Stuff yeah. I was going to say, can, cause yeah, that everything that they do is like, that's kind of their shtick. So, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I think, and it, this is this is me off the cuff. I believe they had it at one point in Unearthed Arcana, but then they that would be way too powerful, it. though. It's like, okay, potentially cool. yeah, I'm yeah. going to uh, stun this guy as well as move him back 10 feet as well as as well as. So 
Okay. It's a lot of it's a lot of lot of different attacks. Yeah. Oh, speaking um, of uh, with different attacks, each attack you do. So like if you are allowed two or three attacks per turn, each of those the weapon mastery is applied to. So if you're a fighter, it's not just like uh like a rogue or something with a sneak attack only being on that first hit. It's every single hit you can graze or nick or push or do whatever. So this is kind of where they were talking about of like chaining different weapons in. Like imagine you're two-handed fighting with a great axe and a sword or something, and they do two different things that really accentuate each other so that you're, you know, just becoming a massive powerhouse. So yeah, I, mean, I love the I, I love the visual of a fighter with just like an arsenal of weapons strapped <laughs> to their back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that they can switch between what they want. And uh, they, they even talked about the fighter specifically can actually change the properties, the weapon mastery properties of different weapons mm -hmm. to kind of customize them to their, their liking too. So that's, that's pretty neat, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the fighter shortly. One other big thing to note is that it, uh, it sounds like all the half caster type classes mm -hmm. um, will get their spell casting at level one. Now they talked about paladin getting spell casting yes. at one. They talked about ranger getting spell casting at one. This is a, a really good change, honestly, in my opinion, because having to wait till level, you know, level two or level three before you can get casting. I, I think learning it from level one is, is very nice to have, and it gives you more tools in your toolbox at level one, uh, when, where sometimes there's just not a lot to do. So I, as much as I want to keep talking about this, I think we need to move forward because we have a lot to cover and we're already half hour in. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, let's, <laughs> let's talk, a, let's talk a little bit about the DMG. So yeah. they, um, they went into the DMG a little bit. Um, uh, I'll, I'll cover the highlights real fast. They wanted this to be a much better lead in to DMing. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make it uh, much more cohesive and they wanted to make it much, uh, a much better flow through which the current DMG, uh, they admitted has a lot of great information in it, but it's very hard to find, which can, <laughs> can agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Like sometimes people will be like, Oh yeah. Did you know that thing is in the DMG? And it's just like, I thought I read the whole thing and I don't remember seeing that because mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. it's probably just in some random spot. Uh, so having like the first, two chapters on just like kind of how to DM um, and their big, their big vision of tell and show mm -hmm. as well yeah. after you tell. That is one of the best things that they could do for the DMG because as someone who's running the game, it's a good idea to kind of, you know, mechanically understand it, but as well as see an example so that you're able to, to really connect those dots. I love that. Yeah. And they, so they even, they said there's going to be five sample adventures that you can use that uh, will kind of give you an idea of how to set stuff up. They are using the Greyhawk setting. So the full Greyhawk setting is going to be in there. They're going to have a map, uh, like a, a fold out map in the physical books or, you know, online, obviously a digital version uh, of the, the city and then the, the setting so that people can take that world if they want and just run with it. There's going to be a massive lore glossary mm -hmm. of all like the biggest, uh, these are the, the D and D things you need to know about, or everyone should know about. So that's a, that's a huge deal as well. We talked about the crafting rules. There's going to be extra crafting rules. Uh, there's going to be a whole chapter on bastions. Uh, we talked about that's, that a little bit when the under Arcana came out. Yeah. And, yeah, it, and that from, is definitely a new system from what they talked about. It, it seems like it, they've expanded upon it since that unearthed arcana and each player will have their own bastion. So it's not just the entire group. And the cool thing about that is, is and they said that it's a sneaky way of getting the players to kind of DM because they're essentially saying what's happening in their bastion, kind of DMing a little mini game inside the larger game. And the cool thing about that is, is that 
all that stuff can still happen when they're out adventuring, you know, far away from town, far away, wherever their bastion is and can be completely done outside of the game and everything. It's just, a, it's a, its own thing to kind of, you know, help keep things in within a game. Yes, exactly. And that's just great. Um, on top of bastions, we have a massive treasure, treasure section. Um, every single magic item has been relooked at in, you know, reworked where needed be. Um, there's a ton more common magic items. There's some nostalgic ones from different things. Like they mentioned, uh, items from the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon from like the eighties are going to be in there. And then of course, as Ryan said, the crafting section, which is going to be a godsend to craft a lot of these really cool new things that uh, expands upon what the players have in the player handbook. Yeah, they also mentioned uh, there's sprinkled throughout. There's going to be these um, template type sheets. Oh, yes. That you can use to fill out for uh, like easy fill outs for sessions uh, for NPCs um, and for different locales and such. So they'll have those that you can kind of like copy and print out uh, if you if you want to. They give a nice little template of here's a here's a quick here, uh, use this thing to make an NPC real quick. That way you have it. You can remember it, right? Mm -hmm. um, they also talked about having a full chapter. Uh, I believe it's chapter three for all of the like niche dungeon master topics yeah. that a dungeon master might need to know, like traps, poisons, siege engines, curses, like, <laughs> like, uh, environmental things. Uh, there's more rules for exploration, which is super cool. Yeah, so NPC all see building. Yeah. NPC building. So all these things, uh, are now contained. <laughs> they, they called it chapter three. I think like the dungeon master yeah, tool. The DM kit, tool essentially. Box. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's super cool. Um, it sounds way more useful than the current version, uh, which was, uh, admitted by them thrown together in a very short time span. Yeah. So I'm glad they're finally getting to come back, put the time and the budget in that they need to with the art and the cohesiveness and the flow uh, to make a much better. I can hand this to a person and they can actually learn how to really be a dungeon master through it. Exactly. And I just have to give a quick shout out to one of my favorite sections that's going to be in there is a whole chapter on different planes. I am super stoked for that. Okay. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> uh, also, they spent a few minutes on the new monster manual. Now yes. we didn't get to see much in the way of like the new stat blocks and stuff. I assume that's coming soon. I'm very interested to see how they've beefed up things, but they said this is going to be their biggest monster manual ever. Yes. of any edition um they touched every single monster uh from the previous monster manual and added over 75 new ones yeah. so everything has been redone there's a bunch of new art um there is a, going to be a bunch of higher cr stuff the gap fill um yeah the the family fill in i think is actually one of the the coolest things uh, the example that they gave was vampires so yeah there's a bunch of different types of vampires but i mean if you have a higher level party the vampires that are kind of there don't really work don't really make sense so they get kind of filled in you know different gaps and levels and everything um blobs were another really good example or oozes you know oozes are generally kind of lower level and stuff but you know, now they have one that has an, uh, an, an apex scale that can eat an entire town. I mean, who's of annihilation or something. Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. And, and I mean, just being able to to take those different families, you know, kind of bulk them up with some really cool stuff. Just to me anyway, shows more dedication to, again, higher level play, which wasn't really supported a ton in the past. But this is another thing that's kind of pointing that to them realizing, hey, People want to go up to level 20 or high or have that high level fantasy and stuff. Here are the monsters that you can use to, to go with them. And yeah. I am and it, stoked about that. It definitely seems like they're setting up to support high level level play better. Mm -hmm. um, Cause they, they talked about how CR ratings uh, will represent the intended like difficulty and deadliness far better 
than a lot of them do <laughs> right yeah. now, which is which is a really good thing because uh, many times when you're setting up an encounter, you have to push the encounter into the deadly category for many parties, especially post level five mm -hmm. to actually make it a challenge. So having CR better represent what the intent is supposed to be is, is actually a really good thing. Yeah. In fact, they, they kept the CR on all the monsters, but like Ryan said, they're, they're reevaluating to make it so that they hit harder so that they're, you know, scarier. So the, the zombie that you saw before, uh, might not be as much of a pushover. Maybe it's hitting harder or has more attacks or something along those lines. You know, I'm just pulling a zombie out of thin air because that's the first thing I thought of, but it, it's that same idea of you might've seen a displacer beast before. Well, guess what? It's a little bit scarier now. Yeah. And one other thing, uh, that kind of lends to the, uh, theory that they are planning on potentially supporting high level play more is the epic boon system that we really didn't talk about uh, much yet, but essentially oh, right. this is like a, a level 19 thing that all the classes will get to choose. Um, and these things are like actual really big deals that come with stat increases as well. That can push your primary stats beyond uh, 20. Uh, and they also even talked about, using these things they they have guidance at least from an xp perspective on leveling past basically leveling past level 20 but instead of going to level 21 you get another epic boon and then another epic boon and then you can continue to build your power and potentially your ability scores up to 30 that way so uh that's also another really interesting piece that makes me think slash hope that they will be supporting high level play more uh, and building more content around it because it is a very chaotic, fun, uh, exciting place to be, even if it is a little more difficult. Um, and some of the, the balance goes a little out the window. <laughs> Now, uh, before we take a step into some of the classes that they've discussed, uh, because again, they're releasing stuff every day. Um, there's one other thing that kind of popped in that, uh, I don't know where it was found exactly, whether it's from when the videos or not, I, I think someone kind of parsed it from there. Um, Ryan, you found the article and we'll have it linked to the, the show notes, of course, but the way that surprise works is actually being changed, which I am super happy about because I was never really a big Agreed. fan of, of how surprise worked before where I was just Agreed. like, Oh, Hey, you're surprised. You just don't get a turn. Um, so the way that they're actually changing it is that if you're surprised, you have disadvantage on your initiative role, which works to, in my mind, so much better because if you're a character who is, you know, alert, who has a high initiative, you still have a decent chance of, you know, being able to react fast enough, you know, to kind of counteract some of that surprise. Um, like, a, uh, I forget what's, what subclass they had. It was, was it the champion, how they always get to roll with advantage on initiative, but this would just, you know, cancel yeah, out so to be a straight mm -hmm. roll. Um, but yeah, I, I think this works out incredibly well and a lot better than just the, okay, well your entire party doesn't get to go and free attacks everyone. Yeah. It's it's, and this is, this is again, one of those rules changes that would supersede the 2014 and mm -hmm. change things around a, a little bit. Uh, if you were playing a, an old like rogue subclass still or something that uses, tries to, has to make use of surprise because um, this is, this is a much better version of it. Mm -hmm. It's a much more interesting version of it. And it makes a lot more sense in the, there's just a higher likelihood that if you're surprised, you will go later. Yeah. Not, not sooner. Um, and then one thing we also didn't talk about Ben was, uh, inspiration. Oh, inspiration yeah. is getting changed as well. It's not <laughs> going to be called inspiration anymore. Uh, probably to differentiate it from like bardic inspiration, it's going to be called heroic inspiration now. Mm -hmm. And what this does, and this, this is actually baked in to some classes or subclasses now, rather than even just the DM giving it out. Mm -hmm. uh, heroic inspiration is now a reroll to anything. It's not advantage. 
It's just a, like you could re-roll a D20, but you could also re-roll a damage die. Yeah. You could re-roll a healing roll. A percentile um, die. A percentile dice. Like this is, uh, it's basically, they said there's enough ways. There's already enough ways to get advantage. They want something that's, uh, can help you feel more impactful. Um, or potentially, you know, um, something that you could spend a little, little more often instead of having and holding it for the perfect D 20 roll. Mm -hmm. Uh, this could actually, you reroll your D 12, uh, on your damage when you get a one, right. Uh, to potentially go higher. So that is a completely changed thing and it's been baked into the base game more. So I, I, I like it. I like that change. Yeah, totally agree. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the classes that have been gone over so far. Um, we're just going to go over some of the things that we thought stood out the most to us. Uh, but in the show notes on dndiscussions.com, there is, are actually some really good summaries by uh, Golden Spider in the uh, slash our D and D subreddit. And we will link to those. If you want to go into a deeper dive, uh, without having to watch the videos. So be sure to check those out. Uh, let's start with the fighter real fast. Um, the fighter, uh, they said the fighter, uh, and the ranger are, are about tied <laughs> for the two classes that got the most new features, which is super cool. Um, one of the big things, uh, that they wanted to do with some of these martial classes, especially, and they talked about this in the Barbarian as well as the Fighter, is they wanted to give them more options or more ability to do cool things out of combat uh, in addition to in combat, which is actually super cool. So fighters are getting this new thing called Tactical Mind, yeah. which allows them to spend second wind charges when they fail checks uh, to roll a die to add to it to see if they can turn it into a success. Uh, and you might say, that sounds boring. We only get one use of technical or uh, second wind uh, per short rest. Well, second wind is getting increased like the it's becoming more of a like actual resource. You will get charges, more charges of second wind. So second wind beyond just healing will let you do other things like the tactical mind and allow you to do those things out of combat, mm -hmm. which is which is super cool. Uh, and that's like a level two ability. Yeah. Uh, and then as you level that tactical mind levels up to and lets you start doing more things. Yeah, exactly. One of the coolest things is that uh, like level nine, they get tactical master that lets them replace a weapon mastery property on their weapon. Uh, like when they hit which I think is really cool on um, at 13, they get studied attacks, which lets them uh, have advantage on the next attack roll if they miss. And considering that fighters get like, you know, 27 attacks per round. I mean, that just works to their favor over and over and over again, being able to kind of swap out your, your, uh, uh, bleh, I'm trying to say the thing now, now it's starting to get late and I can't talk, uh, <laughs> their, their weapon mastery abilities, you know, from one to the other and, and, and kind of swap things around is just kind of, it's going to be the bread and butter and make every single fighter that much more interesting to me. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like forget about the subclasses, which there are some pretty cool ones. Um, just that alone is such an upgrade to this class that, like I said, it, it seems really interesting. I've never played a fighter before, but I really want to do one of the new ones. And in yeah. fact, uh, they, they kept bringing up that, you know, they've been doing a lot of play testing in house so that their home games, if they're playing a fighter, they are just not happy and can't wait for the 2024 books to be released so that they can have all the weapon masteries because it completely changes the way that you play this class. Yeah. They also talked about uh, the fighters fighting styles, um, how they are adding a bunch of them, mm -hmm. uh, some from Tasha's, some brand new ones, uh, and uh, almost all the old ones are getting overhauled in some ways. Basically, they want people to see the fighter as the martial fighting equivalent to like the flexibility of the wizard. Yeah. Essentially they want the fighter to have that same level of versatility um, with all the weapon mastery, the tactical options and all the different things. 
Yeah. And, um, and I got to say, for fighting styles, thrown weapon fighting is just a really cool thing that I can't wait to see. It's just dagger, 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 hand axe, javelin, you know, whatever. There, there's great right sword. Surprisingly, a lot <laughs> of <arm>. weapons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Doesn't matter. Just throw them all. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you uh, can do it in Final Fantasy. <laughs> why not in Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Why not? Um, the four subclasses that are going to be in the player's handbook for fighters are the Battle Master, the Champion, the Eldritch Knight, and the Psy Warrior. Um, obviously, the Battle Master, one of the most popular subclasses for the fighter currently. Uh, it's one of the most complex subclasses still. They try to protect the level of nuance in it. Um, so there's a lot There's a lot of new maneuvers uh, that you'll be able to do, which is super cool. Um, the champion, they wanted to kind of keep the same identity of this is the easy class to play, right? This is the yeah. most straightforward thing. But they wanted it to be more interesting and more fun. Uh, so they, they kind of tried to streamline it, make it not just, this is the, the class that crits more than anybody else. Uh, but they wanted to, they basically make it the, 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 the shining beacon of the fighter, right? The, the advantage on initiative all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the additional fighting styles, um, they have a, a new level 18 feature called Survivor, which gives them advantage on death saving throws. Uh, and they're, <laughs> the crits, like the 18, 19, 20 crits, expand to death saving throws too. Which so if you great. roll like an 18, you get back up, just as if you had rolled a 20 uh, and cool stuff like that. So again, another of the just, this is if you want to go like the basic fighter, Mm -hmm. and not have too much to have to keep track of champion, right? Yeah. Whereas then the Eldritch Knight, they're trying to make it more that fighter mage um, kind of fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest things that I really liked about, uh, you're not school of magic restricted. Anymore, yeah. Which is a huge thing because that was really limiting for the elder tonight. But I think from a fantasy perspective, taking that restriction out is going to be a really big deal. Yeah. That and the arcane trickster rogue, which we might touch on. Um, also no restrictions going forward, which I, I told my arcane trickster rogue in my party. And she was very happy about that. Yeah. And they, and they even made it now. So instead of losing your entire action, Oh, to yeah. cast a spell or a cantrip, you can actually take an, the attack action and replace one of your attacks with a cantrip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which and is then, super cool. Then a leveled spell is what would take the full action. So, you know, what level one, two, three. Well, you can, replace, you can replace two attacks to cast a level one or two spell. Uh, oh, yeah, because right. remember, fighters get fighters, more than that. <laughs> fighters are getting one, two, three, four, five attacks. Uh, they they get the most attacks other than maybe monks, right? Mm -hmm. um, who aren't those aren't just attack actions; those are combined with discipline and your bonus action, and, yeah, and whatnot. But this allows them not to have to just burn their entire action just casting a single spell, and now they can do attacks and do spells in the same time. And really, you can really feel that fighter mage combo fantasy so i think uh both of those are super uh, good quality of life changes definitely and last but not least psy warrior um kind of same deal as eldritch knight where it's intended to be the fighter mixed with something else and uh i mean there wasn't a ton of information on this but i love the idea of basically you're darth vader you can just you know force throw stuff all over the battlefield and attack with a weapon too so uh, looking, looking forward to more on that. I know there's a version of Tasha's, uh, or a version of it in Tasha's, but again, every subclass has been touched. So, we'll but if you want an idea of what it's like, if you don't have Tasha's mm -hmm. Tasha's Tasha's was kind of the, if you, if you had to recommend a book to get for five E Tasha's was very much that book. Yeah. Like, there's just so much stuff in it. And if you had to get two, Xanathar's was the other one. Yeah. Oh, and uh, 
one last thing before we switch. You can also change fighting styles oh, when yeah. you level up. You're That's not right. locked into fighting styles anymore, which is super cool. Yeah. You don't have to be the protection person the entire time if you randomly get a protection sort of, you know, uh, barbarian in. You can just start being attack dude or yeah. archery or something else, anything else. You get to totally change that, which, yeah, that is a huge quality of life change there because, uh, you know, I, I've heard stories of people's like, yeah, I didn't like my fighter because all I could do was just, you know, well, just the one thing which they've added so much more to it now, but it's like I was stuck in a role that it turns out wasn't fun for me. So mm -hmm. being able to swap how you're playing the game, like as you level is a huge benefit. Yeah. Huge benefit. Um, all right, let's, let's move on to Paladins real fast. Uh, Paladin class has had a lot of changes. Uh, yeah, one there's of one or really two controversial. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, <laughs> uh, first off, as we talked about spell casting move to level one. That's nice. Let's mm -hmm. you learn how to use spells right off the bat. You get lay on hands at level one. Uh, you get weapon mastery at level one. You get your fighting styles. There's more fighting styles to pick from mm -hmm. now than there was before. That's super cool. Yeah, It's not restricted uh, at all. So yeah. Yeah. The big one, the big change uh, is divine smite. Yeah. Uh, this has been renamed. Uh, Paladin smite. Yeah. And it's gained at level two. Uh, the big thing about this is smite is now a spell. It is no longer a feature. Now it, it's basically paladins. They they've changed a lot of the smite spells to be bonus actions that mm -hmm. you can then uh, basically use. It, it's still one of those you hit first and then you can choose to cast the smite. Yes. Right. And there's a bunch of different smites you can use, which is obviously pretty cool, but the base smite is now a spell as well. And there, the, this is probably the most controversial change of the paladin because making smite a, the, the base smite a spell instead of a feature suddenly puts extra restrictions on it that weren't there before. Like, mm -hmm. um, Counterspell <laughs> uh, being one of the obvious ones, right? Uh, being able to counterspell a smite. Uh, silence being able to stop a smite. Um, well, do we know if a verbal component is there? I believe there was a verbal component. Then never uh, least, mind. Forget I said anything. Yeah. Uh, I believe that's that's what I've been hearing. These Obviously, we don't have the books yet. Obviously, yeah. things can still change. Right. I, I'm sure things can't change too much more <laughs> because <laughs> it's coming out in September. Uh, so there's only so much time uh, they've got to do mm -hmm. any changes based on uh, it, even if they if they do or not, uh, based on feedback they're getting from some of the videos and, and the talks uh, about this stuff. I know I know the big the big deal was and let's be honest, it was. Paladins could unload damage. Yes. And be nukes like nothing else. Like when you had a few attacks and you could just burn high level slots, you could just do so much damage in two or three rounds. If you just emptied your spell slots and just supernova. Yeah. Everything. And if you look at the other class that can really do this, which would be a sorcerer or a wizard um, one, they get one attack and they're also super squishy wearing cloth. A paladin can go in, lay down tons of damage, and you might not even have a chance of hitting based on if they have a shield and heavy armor. So as someone who has a paladin with some pretty good armor and a shield in my party who does dump a ton of smites into her attacks, um, don't get me wrong. It's amazing to watch, but when you going up against a thing with like 250 health and in one turn, a hundred health is knocked off and only one player is gone. It's a bit spiky and you just all of a sudden it's like, okay, well now I have to make everything live a lot longer to give everybody else a chance to do something cool too. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, and the, one of the other big things is this also nerfed reactions, opportunity attacks. Can't mm -hmm. can't smite for for reactions or opportunity attacks. Um, so a lot of people, and I mean, the, the, I'm I'm a little surprised they just didn't do the obvious of you're limited to one smite action per round. Yeah. Boom. Like that solves a lot of the, the nuke spikiness without introducing all the additional potential restrictions or caveats that turning it into a spell actually does. So I would have to see how this played out. It might be something I would homebrew to like, cause I, I think the, the intent obviously was make it so you could only cast one per round because you can only cast one leveled spell mm -hmm. right per per turn per official rules so that automatically limits smite to once per per attack um you could have also just said you can only do one smite per attack <laughs> and just left it at that and left all the other fancy smites as as spells so just so that you could have something to do if for some reason you can't cast a spell or you don't want your smite counterspelled. Uh, so it's, it's an interest. It was an interesting choice. Very controversial. I'm not sure I'm on board with it. I think the much more elegant solution would have been to just put a limit on the amount of smites you could do mm -hmm. per, per round. Um, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, they are getting a lot of benefits and buffs in other places. Is it enough? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. The, uh, the, I guess the, so I don't want to dwell on that one too long. Some of the other cool stuff though, uh, they are getting fine steed for free. They're making this Every like a paladin. core part of the class, which yeah. is super cool. It's always prepared. You can cast it once a day without using a spell slot, which is super cool. Um, it, they, it's just such an iconic thing. They wanted people to not have to spend spell slots or one of their spell preparations for it. It's mm -hmm. completely redesigned. It has its own stat blocks. Um, hopefully it will come with some mounted combat rules <laughs> cool. as well. Uh, but it has its own like stat blocks so you can really customize your steed to what you want it to be instead of just pulling, having to pull a random horse <laughs> stat block or something like that. So I I'm a huge fan of that. Mm -hmm. Um, that aura, and then there, the aura, yeah, the aura. Is a huge upgrade on this. In fact, um, so instead of having multiple auras squeezed. with multiple ranges and multiple effects, it's just, Hey, you have a paladin aura and in that aura, things happen. And as you level up, more things happen and it makes it so much easier as a player to keep track of because you don't have to be like, okay, well, if you're within five feet of me, you get a bonus to your saving throws. But if you're within 10 feet of me, you can't be frightened. Uh, but then again, if you're within 15 feet of me, um, you know, we can dance if we want to, we can leave our friends behind, you know, there's like so many different things all squished down into one aura now, which is so great. It's one of the best things to paladins for players and DMS alike. It's going to, it's going to really streamline things and help people be able to keep track of stuff so much easier because currently some of the auras have different sizes. <laughs> some of the auras have different effects of whether you start in them or not. Uh, and if you don't, you don't get the effects. So combining this all was a super smart quality of life. Thing. Yeah. In fact, because of that, they actually had to define the whole thing because for the last 10 years, there actually hasn't been a different definition of it. And now it's emanation. So something is emanating from you. Yep. So, I mean, there's, there is a lot of smite, smite stuff aside, because I know people have lots of different opinions on that. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff I think is super cool. Uh, and I think we'll make the paladin a lot more fun to play. Uh, the four subclasses for the paladin that are going to be in this new player's handbook are Oath of Glory, uh, Oath of Ancients, uh, Oath of Vengeance, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Glory. I think that's all they talked about. Ancients. Vengeance. Vengeance. 
There's another one. I uh, it's it's not coming to me at the moment. But there, so there's there's four for each, right? There's four mm-hmm. for each, and all of them have been changed uh, somewhat. Uh, they said a lot of the things they changed, a lot of the out of combat stuff, they've changed to last longer mm-hmm. uh, to make them more useful, which is super cool. Um, Oath of Ancients, they wanted this to be answer the question, what a paladin look like who's been like part of elven culture or a culture that doesn't necessarily have the knight in shiny armor. So like uh, more the, you know, foresty or natural type paladin, which is super cool. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think there's a lot of really cool stuff, uh, a lot of really cool features. If, like I said, we'll have the link to like the full write up if you want to dive into the paladin. Uh, but overall, uh, one, one, one uh, thing really part, quick, pretty good I, changes. I want to pop in that I thought was really interesting that they kind of brought up and pointed out is that, um, like radiant isn't always like, you know, wholly benevolent and like stuff it could also it, it's meaning also radioactive just like necrotic isn't always malevolent because you know death is a part of life and stuff so they're kind of redefining that aspect of it uh i mean unless they always meant it but no one ever thought so but they're redefining that and turning it into something more which i'm actually very excited about because that gives you know you don't have to have a celestial to give radiant damage anymore. It's something entirely different that you can kind of, you know, throw on homebrew stuff or, you know, that they could have added to other types of monsters. So pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I I completely agree. Uh, Let's jump over to barbarians. Oh, Uh, (laughs) there's a lot of new stuff for the barbarian. Um, Big deal. Again, weapon mastery, Mm -hmm. get that at level one. That's cool. Uh, they also have ways to maintain their rage now. Yes. Uh, much more so, which this is, this is kind of a godsend, especially because there's, there are going to be more ways you can get back your rage. I think there's going to, they said there was going to be more charges of rage, but um, you can now just simply use a bonus action to maintain your rage. Yeah. I if love for this. some reason you don't hit something, uh, which is great, especially at lower levels when you don't have as many charges of rage. Uh, and you don't have something to hit for a round and you lose it uh, and you lose a huge part of your class buff. That sucks. Yeah. Exactly. And can be pretty rough. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Danger sense is kind of getting an, an update and everything. You don't have to actually see the source of the danger to get the bonus, which I think is great. Uh, but then big new thing, level three primal knowledge. It's going to be different than what was in t- uh, Tasha's except you know, even though it has the same name, this is actually letting you kind of like hone in and use your just like primal nature and stuff to become proficient in something. Uh, and use like your strength mod instead of something else. Like, um, uh, uh, examples are like intimidation stealth or persuasion, uh, but you can only use it when you're raging. So this is literally one of those, uh, you go up to someone and you're raging and you're all, you don't see me and then just keep walking. And then there you go. <laughs> you just use your strength mod for your stealth check to get by. And yeah, this is, uh, this is a, another one of those. Uh, they want classes to have, especially these martial classes to have more use for out of combat stuff mm-hmm. or social encounters, social situations, because rage doesn't always just equal that. And I think they're trying to dispel this too. Rage doesn't always just equal. I'm just yelling or bloodthirsty or whatever. It could just be a heightened sense of alert. It could just be uh hyper focus on something. And so now that you can officially maintain your rage just through the use of a bonus action, you can actually be, raging quote unquote during social encounters yeah. using your bonus action every six seconds to maintain this rage and then being able to use this new um, primal knowledge to be able to do things like use your best uh, your best skills or your best modifiers for these different skill checks. Yeah. So it, very, very, very cool. And if you want to know what it looks like, watch star Wars, the Phantom Menace and it's, uh, Darth Maul walking back and forth between that barrier, just being pissed off as you're just standing there. He's not in combat. He's just walking back and forth. Yeah. That's what it's going to look uh, like. They're also uh, replacing brutal critical. 
Yes, this with is a, a new thing update. called yeah, Brutal Strike. Um, they said Brutal Critical was never very satisfying, um, but now Brutal uh, Strike lets you when you're using reckless attacking, you can forgo using advantage to deal more damage when you hit along with an additional effect. So instead of getting that advantage, you do the more damage dealing like you usually do, but you also could push enemies back, slow them down different, uh, different options that they said can actually pair very well with yeah. weapon masteries, like double pushing, extra, you know, distance or, or, or whatever. Um, so that's, that's going to actually be really cool as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It, it gives a barbarian kind of more of a, a, a tactical feel to it than just, I'm going to go hit that thing. I'm going to go hit that thing. Now, you know, you, you're able to kind of think out different ways that you can do different things and, uh, like uh, giving you more control over the battlefield, which is something that I love about a lot of these weapon mastery updates. You know, you can push into barriers, you can push them into, um, uh, you know, hazards that like the wizard has set up or something or the druid or whatever. Um, you can slow things down so that, you know, they can't get away as fast. You know, there, there's so many different things that they can do. So being able to use a brutal strike with that and on top of that, giving you that weapon master like effect, there's a ton of different things that you can do. And I know that as like these books are released, we're going to see tons of different combinations and things that people have tried and played that are going to just kind of blow our minds with how they put some of these together. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited again, like they said, flexibility, being able to play a little more your way, not being locked in to things. And we, we see that in the subclasses too. So mm -hmm. there's, there's four subclasses, obviously for this, uh, we are getting, uh, Path of the Berserker, which is kind of your uh, your stereotypical uh, barbarian class, Path of the Wild Heart, which is uh, renamed from uh, Path of the Totem Warrior. So you get, you know, all the different animal spirits and such still. Path of the Zealot, uh, which is from Xanthar's, and um, the brand new one uh, that is not from anything else. This is brand new just yeah. to this called path of the world tree. Uh, so I, I think like berserker is, is fairly self-explanatory wild heart. Um, the big changes in this is that you can actually switch your totems. You can switch your spirits that you're, you're going through. You're not saying I'm a bear totem or whatever. Like now it's, you can actually switch these things and do different ones depending on the situation that you're in uh, and the effects you need from it. So it's a much more holistic type thing, which plus, I think is, is super cool. Plus there's a ton more animals too. So they're giving you a lot more options on top of just being able to switch. So you're completely bend tending the situation and, you know, tying into <laughs> whatever animal you need in order to kind of, yeah, yeah. you know, be successful with this stuff, which is really cool. Super cool. Uh, and then, we I think we need to talk for just a minute about Path of the World Tree because this is so this cool. is brand new, rooted in like Norse Nordic stuff, right? Um, yeah. So like, like Path of the Zealot, it's turning about turning your gaze towards the larger cosmos, primal power uh, of nature and connecting to the World Tree, which connects in lore all worlds of the multiverse, right? Yeah, which is. Uh, absolutely sp uh, specifically cool um first of all you need a dwarven throwing hammer uh whenever you choose this and you need to be a dwarf so you can throw it <laughs> um but you no know, some of the neat things that the path of the world tree does is that um you're able to uh use this like very magical based uh subclass to do different things like give your party uh, temporary HP because you're tapping into that world tree. Um, you're able to like make a magical path. So I don't know, maybe the rainbow bridge, I guess at this point, um, but even more <laughs> so the coolest thing is like at higher levels, you can teleport. So you can teleport your party. You can teleport enemies. You can do different things that, like, again, cause a lot of movement to happen on, on the battlefield and well off the battlefield and stuff. And it's just, it's really cool. And 
such a creative, different kind of version of what we've seen as a barbarian, you know, yeah, we've had like, you know, wild surges and magical stuff like that, but this one's really more of a, uh, you know, leaning into that. And it looks pretty cool from everything that they've showed us so far. Yeah. I feel like this is a little bit like the barbarian version of the Eldritch Knight kind of the, yeah. the very magical based thing. Like they had the the quote of, I can teleport to you. I can make you stay there. I can teleport you to me. And at higher levels can teleport my whole party to you. <laughs> it's, like, it's super fun where, so that's kind of like the magic thing. Whereas path of the zealot is more like the barbarian paladin type mm -hmm. version where the powers from like the gods and such. So uh, very, very cool uh, dichotomy of, barbarian classes and a whole lot of fantasies that you can kind of fulfill within, within those things. Yeah. It, it's looking cool. I've always been a fan of barbarians and, uh, you got to play one for a tiny bit myself. And now with like these changes in the subclass stuff, it like just that persistent rage alone is worth it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then finally, uh, the most up to date that we have the rogue, uh, the rogue is super interesting. They said this is one of the like most enjoyed classes right now. And one of the ones they really felt like they didn't need to mess with a ton because it was already pretty good. Uh, but one of the, the big things they added beyond again, weapon mastery, uh, which can shake things up a lot, uh, is a brand new feature to the base rogue class called cunning strike. Uh, the rogue gets this ability at level five and it allows you to trade sneak attack dice for other things. So one of the things they were like, man, the rogue gets a lot of sneak attack dice, which is great, you know, more damage, <laughs> right? But uh, what cunning strike does, it is allows you to trade your, some of your sneak attack damage dice for things like poisoning the target tripping the target, uh, withdrawing from combat without an attack of opportunity. And there's a lot more options at higher levels. Uh, this feature then enhances as you level up your rogue. So it gives you again, more tactical options for things you can do. Uh, you can decide if you want to do that damage or if you don't need to do all that damage and you want to set up for another attack or for another person in your party. So there's, there's a lot that that's like the big thing, um, from the rogue itself, uh, that is getting added beyond the weapon mastery. Yeah. And something that they mentioned is that basically, uh, you know, they didn't want to mess up how rogues are played. And with that, what they're doing is just cranking up the volume on what rogues are good at. And that alone is actually something pretty cool because like you said, rogue is one of the most like stable, fun, well done classes that they have so far. But, yeah. Man, cunning and cunning strike is really cool. <laughs> yeah. It's super cool. And then, uh, the rogue obviously is getting four subclasses as well. Um, the two classics are coming back assassin and thief. And then we also have arcane trickster, which is a, a fan favorite mm -hmm. and the soul knife, which is the psionic version. There's several psionic type subclasses uh, within the, the player's handbook. Uh, but the big change in a lot of ways is for the assassin because the assassin has long been considered kind of hard to play or kind of underpowered because so much of it relied on surprise. And surprise was very hard in a lot of ways with the current rule setup. Now, assassins have been fully revamped. Um, and since the surprise rules have changed, there was there's not as much emphasis on needing to do that. They revamped the assassinate feature. Uh, it gives the assassin rogue advantage on initiative, which means they can go likely go first or high up uh, the extra damage that they do now only really needs to be done before another character has acted that round. Uh, and with the advantage on initiative, there's a much higher chance they will get to act first and be able to take advantage of that feature rather than uh, have to do some weird, you know, surprise things. So there's, there's a lot of, I think, Assassin was one of the biggest 
changes they made uh, for all the subclasses. Um, Arcane Trickster, like you said, the spell class restrictions are gone. Mm -hmm. Huge. That's going to make things way more interesting. Uh, There'll be a few extra things you can do with your mage hand, which I love. That's already a, a really fun aspect of the Arcane Trickster that allows you to do a lot of stuff. So having... Uh, that extra stuff is really cool. Uh, and then finally, like Soul Knife, uh, the actual Soul Knife blades can use weapon mastery <laughs> and are more integrated into uh, the class itself. So there's there's a lot of it. it this is probably one of the least tweaked classes mm-hmm. in general. Uh, but what they have tweaked seem to be good. Like it seems like it's it's just enhancements uh, or quality of life on top of um, the class rather than we went through and reworked a lot of the innards. So the funny thing is, is that the uh, going back to assassins, so that assassinate feature, uh, I thought that's how it already was because of Baldur's Gate (laughs) three. I'm just like, I go first, bam, extra damage. You're just gone and total bam, extra damage. Okay. We're, we're hiding now, but, yeah. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised because this obviously the 2024 rules have been in development for quite some time. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the Baldur's Gate three stuff either informed some of the 2024 stuff or uh, was informed by it because um, they the like Baldur's Gate three does have like a version of weapon mastery in a lot of ways. Uh, which people people really liked. So yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if there was some give and take back and forth sharing uh, between those things as well. Yeah, and funny enough, it's kind of a weird way to kind of play test Dungeons and Dragons by seeing how it actually works in Baldur's Gate and, you know, having kind of uh, tested out there. So yeah, um, overall though, Rogue looks really great. I know that my Arcane Trickster is... Like I said, super happy about the the spell class being opened up and the fact that not a ton of stuff is really changing is is great. And as you said, this class didn't really need a lot of tweaks and the little bits that they did really kind of pull it in line with a lot of the other changes to other classes to kind of, I, I guess the best way to put it is to make the rest of the classes as well thought out and balanced as the rogue already was. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, like I said, if you want to dive into all the details, we will have the links to all these summaries on dndiscussions.com. So definitely go check that out because um, these are these are very well put together. And uh, we will likely have lots more to talk about next week uh, as more and more classes are getting detailed uh, and things released. Likely we'll see more stuff from the Dungeon Master's Guide and the monster manual coming here soon as they talk about more things. But for now, this is, we've been talking a while, Ben. I think, I think it's about time to, to wrap things up. Yeah. Uh, before we do though, um, I've got a really cool community shout out that I have to toss out there just because, um, it's something that I came across on Instagram. Yes, I know. And I'm, I'm an old man if I use Instagram, but I'm old, it's fine. Um, Basically, it's it's a, a fantasy calendar generator that also includes lunar cycles. Um, way back early in my game, uh, they asked me, oh, you know, they, wh- what do we see in the sky? Like, you know, is there a moon? I'm like, no, there's three just completely out of nowhere. I'm just like, it'd be cool to be, you know, live in a place with multiple moons and stuff. And I've always been kind of sitting there like, well, I don't really know how that works. I don't really know like when certain phases would be there, how long it takes to orbit and all this stuff. So I went to uh, Don John and we'll, we'll have a link to the, the fantasy calendars specifically. Um, but I was able to kind of go through and, you know, create my own calendar. And I got to say it, it is great. Um, th- plus on top of that, there's tons of different kind of like generators and stuff like that for a hundred different things. Um, on this website, it's it's donjon.bin.sh. You can go there, 
tons and tons of stuff uh, from names to world generators, map generators. Uh, now they're very, very basic maps, but you know, it'll kind of give you a good, you know, structure to kind of build off of, uh, the calendar, of course. Um, they also have things like sci-fi things. They have weird fiction. They've got, uh, uh, Blade Runner stuff. I mean, tons of different things. Definitely check the site out. We'll have a link to the calendar from there. You can kind of take a look and see everything else that is uh, available as well. So, uh, like I said, donjon.bin.sh. Awesome. I use this generator a ton. They oh, have cool. so much good stuff on Donjon. So definitely check that out. Like Ben said, we'll have the link in the show notes for that. Uh, apart from that, I know we usually talk a little bit about uh, what we've been doing in our own campaigns. Uh, we've been talking a lot, so we'll keep it brief tonight. And it's nice because I can let Ben have all the time because <laughs> we haven't gotten to play uh, for an extra week uh, just because of scheduling. Uh, we're actually doing back to back sessions uh, this coming Friday and next Friday, which I'm very excited about. Uh, so I'll be able to talk a little bit about those next episode. Uh, but Ben, I know you had a session you did recently that, uh, that the combat that we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Last um, time. The fun thing is I've actually had two sessions since we recorded last. So I've got a lot to talk about, but I will make it brief because again, long show, it always feels like when I have the most stuff to talk about, I'm very limited on time at this point. Um, but uh, you know, we, we went ahead and, you know, started playing and everything. I had them, uh, roll. F well, first of all, started off where pretty much right where we left off before with the zombie sharks and the zombies and all that stuff. Um, invited the, the team into the captain's quarters for dinner. We had a actually pretty interesting philosophical discussion about faith. Uh, and because the, there's a storm cleric, uh, or a Tempest cleric on board on the ship. Cause you know, the, they're really good on ships. Um, and he asked our cleric kind of about faith and they discussed things and stuff. And it was a really good, like RP philosophy discussion, which was just loads of fun to do. So I'm like, this, this is great. So then next day, uh, you know, I had them roll to see what was going to happen. And luckily they rolled the pirate encounter. And, um, so what I did is I went through and I looked at the, the supplement that we talked about last time, the, the cannons and shoot, I forgot exactly what it was called, but it was, it was the, the seafaring one that we kind of talked about. Um, and I gotta say it had some good supplemental stuff in there. I did like it. Um, uh, captains and cannons. That's what it was. Um, but I am not fully happy with how it played out exactly. I had to tweak it a little bit beforehand to kind of fit in with what I've already, you know, talked about. And then on top of that too, you know, only having gone through the whole work like once, um, I don't think I did damage exactly the right way because there's like a damage threshold that I wasn't actually meeting and stuff. But even then the damage that my playership was inflicting on them was like so overboard compared to like, you know, any sort of combat that I was kind of hoping for, um, that that's even when I tweaked down how much damage the cannons would actually do. And if I had gone by the stats given the ship would have been destroyed before they even came within like a hundred yards of them or a hundred feet or whatever. I know the, you know, short distance and stuff. So, um, kind of, you know, played around with that and everything, got it to the point where the, the pirates came alongside and they were trying to board because, uh, well, they, they don't know what the pirates full motivation was other than they're pirates. And that's when, you know, my, the passengers on this passenger cargo ship decimated a lot of pirates <laughs> to the point where a lot of them were just giving up, just didn't want to have anything to do with the fight anymore. They were done. They wanted to be taken hostage and it got to the point where the captain even said just let me go down with my ship because they had done so much damage they had thrown some fireballs at it it was burning it was sinking wasn't gonna last and um so you know they they captured the the captain and everything they were able to uh loot the captain's quarters before the ship you know fully scuttled and uh you know it had some really cool stuff so then they had seven pirates and the captain in the brig on the ship 
So I'm just like, okay, this is great. Uh, and then, you know, I, next session happened, picked up kind of right after that. Cause that, that CD encounter. So it took a while for it to kind of get through. Um, oh yeah. Also figuring out the mapping and how it worked and everything like that and turning and stuff like that. A little hard on a virtual tabletop, but, uh, you know what we figured out, we got, we made it work. Um, so anyway, so the last session that we had, um, just this last weekend, uh, you know, we started out again, had them roll for it, see what, what kind of day it was. And it was one of the fun days that I kind of figured out and it was a fishing day. You know, the sky was, or the, the sun was high in the sky. It was bright. The wind was blowing. It was a perfect day to be on the sea. So the ship's cook is like, Hey, we're going to go fishing. You guys want to join in? They said, yeah, sure. It's great. So off the, the stern of the ship, we had a whole bunch of like, you know, rod set up and everything. And, uh, uh, I totally made everything up on the fly on how we're going to do this. Um, because yeah, sure. I made, I said the encounter was going to happen, you know, in my, if they roll this, this is what they get. Didn't figure out how it was going to work, but, um, essentially what it is, I had them roll a dex check to see if they land the fish. If they hit a certain, you know, uh, difficulty, then I had them roll a D 20 and that was going to determine the size of the fish. And then from there I had them roll strength checks to see if they're able to, to reel and pull it in. And it actually worked out pretty well. We were able to have some really exciting things happen where, um, you know, a couple of the fish, you know, did get off, you know, or the line broke or whatever, but, uh, it was a ton of fun. We had a grand old time with it. And on top of that, my arcane trickster rogue being the arcane trickster that she is, did awesome stuff like used her mage hand to help kind of steady the, the, the rod, um, for someone who was having an, an issue. Uh, the bard was giving up bardic inspirations. Um, you know, they were, uh, giving advantage by like having two people hold the pole. If it was like a really big fish and stuff. And then finally, um, because I had the, the, their navigator, the awakened otter, like fishing with them. Cause he, he'd never done it before off of a boat. He always, you know, had to swim to catch his fish. So he was like super excited about this. And when I rolled his fish, I got a nat 20. <laughs> so I'm like, Oh man. So our arcane trickster on her last level up picked up vortex. So she just basically like this otter amazing. and, and his, his, uh, uh, line are about to go into the, the, the water and she just cast vortex on the fish and then plopped a giant Marlin just on the deck right there. <laughs> so she was like total MVP and they had like fish for days now. Um, you know, they, they went ahead and, you know, butchered and everything, all that stuff. But, but yeah, it was a ton of fun. We had a, a great time with it. Everybody did something great. Everybody caught a fish. Um, <laughs> I believe our arcane trickster road actually caught the smallest one. So then she cast enlarge on it to make it bigger. Um, so you that's know, incredible. Oh yeah. It, it was, it was a ton of fun. We, we had a blast with that. So then, you know, they finished the day and everything, uh, had their long rest next day, had them roll for it. And then I'm like, okay, who's going to be the first one out of the, out of, because our barn is casting magnificent mansion as one of the doorways for the crew or like the passenger quarters. So instead of a small, tiny room, they go in and then there's the magnificent mansion there. So they're, they're staying in there uh, as opposed to, you know, renting out rooms on the ship. So it's tons of fun with that. So then I'm like, okay, who's going to be the first one out. And then turns out our sorcerer was the first one out, open up the door and immediately heard a loud bang. And the ship was moving all over the place. And she had to do a, a or he had to do a dexterity saving throw to make sure he didn't fall down and face planted and stuff. Turns out they're in a massive storm. So then he called in, got everybody out and they went up to the top deck to help with the sails and uh, make sure that, you know, people were tied down so that they didn't go overboard. Um, lightning struck. Our cleric had to bring someone back from death because, you know, the, the lightning hit him and he was going to die any minute or, you know, in, in three rolls, probably. Um, the, I went ahead and I'm like, you know what? My storm based sorcerer, this is their thing. So I kind of gave them the advantage yep, yep. on knowing kind of what's going on. Um, they're doing their, their, you know, like kind of, you know, wind control and stuff, pushing them towards the outer edge. Um, I'm like, you know what? You're level 14. 
you're a storm sorcerer. You're in tune with this. So I, I let him do a, a role to see if he can figure out like where the next lightning strike would be to potentially save someone and, uh, rolled pretty well. So I'm like, yeah, it's going to land on the back part. Um, you're not sure who it's going to, you know, be near, but she's, uh, or he called out, you know, you two and you two move forward at least five feet. So they move forward and lightning missed one of them. And so, you know, all this is happening and, um, our, our paladin was able to, you know, use her strength to, to raise those sails super fast. And, uh, the bard's tying people down, making sure everybody's doing good. Um, I, f- I forget who, I think, it, no, the cleric, the cleric cast water walk on everybody. So one, if they fell off the boat, they wouldn't, you know, go under, but two, I made it so that it helps stabilize them on the ground or on the ship because, you know, the deck's entirely covered with water. So they're not slipping around and moving as much. And then again, my arcane trickster rogue totally outside the box thinking here. She did shape water to kind of like give herself like water legs so that she was stable on the, on the deck. I'm like, that's really cool. We're doing that, which the really fun thing is, is that the the bard isn't that bright. So when they first got on the boat, she asked about what are sea legs because she had heard that phrase being ta- talked about before, and she saw the, the rogue with that. She's like, "Those are sea legs." So, it, anyways, inside joke, long story, a lot of fun. So, anyway, so all this is happening. They're finally kind of getting you know out of the storm, and that's when the rogue's like, "Oh, I'm gonna run downstairs." to check in or, you know, below deck to see if we need to bail because, you know, we've been taking on water. So she gets down there, gets down to the, the, the bottom deck. And as she gets off the stairs and turns around, she sees seven freed pirates and then the pirate captain out of their cage, arming themselves. And that's where we left off. So prison yeah. break. Yep. I'm like, they took, te- they took them as prisoners. They're pirates. They're going to figure out a way to get out of this. We're doing this at some point. I'm like, what better cover than a storm for them to pick their lock or break the door or whatever to get out and then try to take the ship. So I am excited for what's going to happen next. Yeah. No, this is a, uh, it sounds, that sounds really fun. It sounds like you've got a, a very action packed next session coming oh, up so much so and the best part is she's the only one who knows what's going on because she's the only one who went down below decks oh no the entire rest of the crew is above deck to you know to work make sure everything's good while yeah. they're in the storm so yeah it's i mean she's a rogue so she could just haul butt out of there but we'll see what happens because she's an arcane trickster and she had she plays that class so freaking well and mm-hmm. is able to just affect so much in combat. So awesome. I'm excited to see what will happen. Very cool. Very cool. I'm excited to hear uh, more of that the next time we talk. But uh, I think with that, oh, we will definitely call this one of our longer episodes that we have done. Yeah, uh, especially without a guest. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, well, Ben, why don't you tell everybody uh, where we can be reached real fast? And if you have questions, your own stories, uh, whatever for the show, we would love to hear from you. Um, ben, why don't you tell everybody where they can do that? You bet. Um, best place to reach us is going to be our email. That's dndiscussions at gmail.com. So show name at gmail.com. Um, that's where you can, you know, send us an email about anything. You can tell us about uh, stuff that's happening in your game or your thoughts on some of these changes that are coming up uh, with the new player handbook and, uh, or dungeon master guide or whatever, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we read everything that you guys send. Uh, I'm slow at responding. Ryan's better than I am, but we like to make sure that we both read the email before something goes out. So, uh, you'll get a response just might not be right away, but send those in. Um, if you want to do something, you know, with a much faster response time, usually you can always find us on uh, blue sky social. Uh, the show is at DN discussions. Ryan is at TBK Zord and I am at Ben Bumhofer. Now, another way to kind of interact with us, of course, is going to be our discord channel. Uh, you can find a link to that on our website, dndiscussions.com, where you'll also find every single episode we have ever done. That is right. 
all 114 episodes are on there. And in fact, next episode, I'll say all 115 episodes are on there because that's how that works. But, uh, you know, reach out. We love to talk to people. We love hearing your stories. And, uh, you know, we've got channels just for that. So jump in, join us, say hi. That being said, though, uh, Ryan, thank you very much for agreeing with me that we should definitely hold off to record but oh my gosh there's still more <laughs> stuff coming out and i'm excited to talk about that with you too so much yeah so uh, much stuff yeah by the time we record again there's going to be like a whole nother slew of of classes to talk about it's going to be great um but with that until then everybody make sure that you roll high and be good to each other take care and we'll see you soon